On behalf of the National Collaborating Center for Indigenous Health, I welcome each of you to today's webinar entitled First Nations Inuit and Métis Peoples and Physical Activity During COVID-19. My name is Roberta Stout, and I'm a research associate with the National Collaborating Center for Indigenous Health. Our center is located at the University of Northern British Columbia in Prince George on the traditional territory of the Clay Claytonay First Nation. I am, however, zooming in from Winnipeg in beautiful Treaty One territory and the homeland of the Métis. I will be facilitating today's webinar. Very briefly, the NCCIH is one of six national collaborating centers for public health that was established in 2005 with funding from the Public Health Agency of Canada. Our sister NCCs are focused on specific topic areas, including infectious diseases, environmental health, healthy public policy, determinants of health, and methods and tools for knowledge translation. Our center supports health equity for First Nations, Inuit and Métis peoples by promoting the use of indigenous informed evidence to transform practice, policy and program decision-making across all sectors of public health. The NCCIH is one of six funded champions in the Public Health Agency of Canada's two-year project related to the common vision for increasing physical activity and reducing sedentary living in Canada. This webinar is part of our work on this initiative. So all questions for panelists, as well as technical questions can be submitted in the Q&A window at the bottom of the screen. Links to resources mentioned will be posted in the chat window. Today's session is being recorded and will be available on the NCCIH website. There may be brief pauses as we switch between the presenters. As well, there is live captioning available by clicking the live transcript button on the bottom of the screen. The focus of today's webinar is to create awareness of the importance of physical activity, recreation and sport, and historical and contemporary, contemporary realities of First Nations, Inuit and Métis peoples in Canada within the landscape. It will look at strategies and innovative approaches that prioritize Indigenous experiences, practices, and community voices within this field. Examples of ways for individuals, children, youth, and families to initiate or maintain physical activity in the context of COVID-19 and beyond will be explored. We have four esteemed presenters today for this session. Each of their full bios will be posted in the chat. Each presenter will be speaking for 15 minutes, which will be followed up by a Q&A at the end with all presenters. We will begin by presenting the bio for Dr. Tricia McGuire Adams, who will be our first speaker. She's a Anishinaabe Kwe from Binji Niashia Anishinaabek in the Robinson Superior Treaty Territory. Tricia conducts community-driven research in Indigenous health and wellness, and she is passionate about fostering decolonial physical activity processes. Dr. McGuire Adams is an assistant professor in the Faculty of Education at the University of Ottawa. I wanna welcome Dr. McGuire Adams and hear from her on this presentation. Hello everyone, please give me one quick minute while I share my screen. So welcome. Um, I will be introducing myself again. Thank you so much, Roberta, for your kind introduction. So my uh, presentation today is focused on my Debajamawin, or my personal story of navigating wellness through COVID-19. 
So bonjour, de Biki Shago Queen Edition Akas, Meshkwa Deze Dodem, Bengwani Ashi and Ishnabek, Nedonji and Mki Wakudon Nedonji. So I am an Ishnabe from uh, Bengwani Ashi and Ishnabek, but also I was raised in Thunder Bay, Ontario. Um, so that's where I, I call home. And I'm um, speaking to you today from the unceded territory of the Algonquin and Anishinaabe Nation. And I'm very thankful to be part of this conversation today. It's an important one to have. And uh, miigwech, thank you for the NCCIH for the invitation. And it is great to be among such amazing speakers today. So just a brief overview, I will, the goal, uh, as Roberta mentioned, was to speak to some strategies and innovative approaches to remove barriers to physical activity and during COVID. And as many of you are aware, uh, we were isolated and most of us were at home alone. And so I wanted to share a little bit about what that was like for me in my Dabajamawin, which is a personal story and how I navigated both my chronic illness and my mental and physical wellness during COVID-19. And the goal of this is to shed a light on the daily struggles to then create a shift in mindset, <clears throat> excuse me, about physical activity. Struggle. So like many of us, COVID-19 amplified struggles with holistic wellness. We all had to adjust to working from home, living from home, uh, most of us, or a lot of us with family also working from home. Uh, I have a little one, uh, he's uh, nine years old and he was studying from home as well. And so this created, um, uh, I guess for the first little bit, some challenges because it, it was all about change. And um, yeah, to go forward from this change I found for myself, and I'm not sure if this might resonate with other folks, but I had a tendency for overwork. Um, my office was in my home and so I would often work steadily throughout the day without even getting up off of my chair, um, just working. Sometimes I would even forget to eat. I would just work. Um, and so um, there was a tendency for this as well during COVID-19. And through this, I could not center my physicality. Um, of course, all the gyms were closed. So the spaces that I went to before to find community and to find uh, friendship and to find places of outlet uh, for my physicality were gone. And of course, because I couldn't have physical activity in my life, my, well, my mental wellness was disrupted. Of course, mental and physical, as well as emotional and spiritual are all connected. And my research really dives into understanding how that holistic wellness is fostered through physical activity. So all of this was disrupted. But I wanna say all of these responses to being isolated from family and friends and community are normal. We were all living through this and I try to remind myself to be gentle and to have no shame about some of these struggles. So I realized that during isolation, I began to hyper focus on what I used to do. I used to run. I used to lift heavy weights. I used to teach kettlebell classes as I'm a certified kettlebell coach. And I used to train Brazilian Jiu Jitsu. I had just earned my blue belt during one of the, um, uh, the lockdowns. And so I'm a newly minted blue belt in Brazilian Jiu Jitsu, but I couldn't train. And I'm a Muay Thai practitioner as well. And that was gone too. So I got caught up with thinking, well, I used to be fitter. I used to be stronger. I used to be healthier. I used to be committed to, et cetera. But I realized through mindfulness practice that these thoughts are a shame spiral, of course, leaning into Brene Brown's work. And they're, they're harmful to my well being. Sitting in regret or sitting in the past or comparing myself to a past version of myself did not help me feel well in that moment. So, how did I choose to address this? undressing unbalance. Again, like many of us, I live with chronic illness. I've lived with Hashimoto's hypothyroidism and adrenal fatigue um, for 20 plus years. And I've navigated it really well for the first 
part of my life in my 20s and my 30s. But through COVID, it got worse. It was the worst it's ever has been. And of course, this makes sense now that I'm, I'm through it. I'm, I'm uh, on the other side of it where I, I'm living with wellness now. But it makes sense to me that my chronic illness would become amplified during isolation. The stress, the overwork, which created persistent insomnia. I had a lack of balance with my physical activity and my nutrition. Um, I pushed myself through the fatigue that I was navigating, which ultimately made everything worse. I had multiple and lasting flare-ups of my chronic illness through COVID-19, which led to depression. There were many days where I, I couldn't get out of bed or I didn't feel like getting out of bed. And this is to normalize some of these struggles. I'm sure I'm not the only one who has had to live with such struggles. And all of this is to say I was not present in the relationships that I had in my life. And I woke up one morning in the midst of a flare up and this thought came to me. I am no longer going to be a willing participant in undoing my well being. And that thought helped me to think about changing my mindset, changing my practices so that I could recenter my wellness. One of the ways that I continue to uh, look to change my mindset was by listening to other experts in the field. One of the uh, podcasts I listen to is by Amy Porterfield, and she has a podcast called Talking Body. And it was through listening to her podcast that she explained, we often experience body grief when we begin to live with a differently abled body due to chronic illness. And I realized that I was experiencing this body grief because my body was not responding um, in the way that I expected it to through my chronic illness. But in addition to that, I realized that my grief was also tethered to not being able to connect to my communities through physical activity. As I mentioned, I'm a certified kettlebell instructor and both my partner and I we co-teach um, a Four Vitality Kettlebell program with two of our dearest and closest friends as well. And this was just gone. And this was a place where we found community, we found strength, we found uh, camaraderie, laughter, and all of that was gone. So I was experiencing the grief of being disconnected from my community and my community in particular that prov provided me with wellness. So how did I choose to let go of the grief of the what I used to be uh, and the shaming of how I used to be something or I used to do something? How I shifted this mindset was I began journaling. And some of the pages you've seen on previous uh, slides were actual pictures from my journal. So I began journaling about what I was feeling, about what I was learning through podcasts and other books about wellness and maintaining balance. I started a daily meditation practice through Insight Timer, which for me, I, I didn't realize how much it would provide me with balance, um, this daily meditation practice, but man, it has. Um, I began reading more. Reading is my, one of my favorite hobbies and um, I lost focus of that again amongst the overwork and all of the stressors. So I took time to read again. Um, and I limited social media. For me, that made sense to balance all of the multiple tabs that were open in my brain. I recognize that some people, that these are my strategies that might not resonate with other people as well. So there's no judgment there. So then I began weight training based on where I'm at, not on what I used to be able, be able to do. Uh, I recognize that I have privilege in that, um, I have a supportive partner and a family where we love to, to work out. And so we, we also had the financial privilege to buy uh, weights and to create a mini little gym where we live. And so um, I was able to start weight training again. And again, it wasn't based on what I used to do. I wouldn't shame myself or, oh, I'm only at this level of, of weight training. It was just picking up and starting where I was at. We would also do daily family walks, connecting again with each other, making sure we got outside together and we were playful with each other. And I also started to focus on my sleep 
because when I when I experienced persistent insomnia, it just amplified all of my chronic illness signs and symptoms. And so I needed to practice mindful um, practices around good sleep and nutrition for my wellness. And I put in a quote there, this was not a diet. I'm firmly against diet culture. I think that we need to uh, eat for our wellness uh, and not deprive ourselves of anything. Um, and so also all of this through I've learned is to be gentle, to be non shaming, and to be kind to myself. And most importantly, I learned to rest without judgment. Resting for me with my chronic illness is a sign of um, taking care of my wellness. I recognize that this is a lasting journey. It is not a one-stop solution. I'm not looking for a switch to flick for my wellness because that will never happen. I now understand that my wellness is a journey that needs to be flexible and to adapt to where I'm at. And I really appreciate this quote that I read in the book, Burnout. And it's called, and it says, well-being is not a state of being, but a state of action. So I took those steps on the previous slide. Those were my actions that I chose to take in my life to help me to create balance and to help me to create wellness again in my life. But I also, through this process, leaned into my communities and into ceremony where I can and when I can. Um, and two of my most closest to my heart communities that I'm involved in is the Radical Academic Esquewa Goddesses, or RAGE. And together with my dear friends, um, Dr. Cindy Gaudet, Lana Whiskey Jack, <clears throat> excuse me, and Ms. Ward, we come together to foster our wellness practices together. Um, and we do this because we are Indigenous women in the academy. And uh, this space is a space where uh, I am able to reach deep into my wellness practices with other Indigenous women, which has been very affirming for me. And I'm also part of a recreation collective that is a gathering of many different voices and many different perspectives and people. Um, and we are taking a deep intersectional approach to understand how sport and physical activity um, can uphold settler colonialism and how by taking this intersectional approach, we want to dismantle it. We want to create a system that is about joy and movement desires based on where everybody is at. So I'm very privileged to have these two spaces to help me also to enact well-being. So this is my last slide. And again, this quote that I picked up on one of my podcasts um, was, is do not let what you cannot do interfere with what you can do. And for me, this again, helped me shift my mindset to be non-judgmental of my daily practices of movement and physical activity. If there's days I need to rest, then I rest without judgment. If there's days where I feel full of life, full of energy after uh, a working all day and I'm able to do a weight workout, I feel, I feel well and I thank my body for that. And I've lessened the grief and the shaming around, I used to be able to do this. I used to do this. And I have to mindfully, um, cons whenever that thought comes in my mind, I have to remember that it's not serving me and I put it down. And I'm continually on this learning journey about being mindful about my thoughts. And the most recent book that I'll, I'll share is, um, it's in, in my resource list as well, is um, through John Acuff's most recent book. And he, through his book, he's, he tells his readers that mindset is um, choosing what thoughts we want to align ourselves with. And that speaks very deeply to me in terms of letting go of the grief and the shame around what I used to be able to do. And then also I return to the strong woman stories that are in my book from the Anishinaabe Quake who uh, were uh, shared their own strong stories of decolonized physical activity. And all these things put together uh, provide me deep strength to continue um, striving for wellness as a journey it's not a destination. Um, and so today I feel good and miigwetch for listening. And I hope 
um, that some of my personal story, my debaja on might have resonated with yours. Miigwech. Thank you so much for sharing your, your wellness journey with us. Uh, it, it really, really resonated with me and I'm sure with many of the other people on the webinar. And I also wanna thank you for offering up um, some ideas on recentering and balancing our mindset moving forward as we all go through this pandemic together and as we move beyond it. So thank you so much for that beautiful presentation. Um, I'm now going to introduce Stranger, who is a lifelong urban Inuk. He was born in St. John's, Newfoundland and raised in Ottawa. Although he was not raised in his Inuit culture and heritage, he is now an educator on, on both of these um, things. So Stranger has been working with youth since the age of 15, when he took a leadership training position at Christie Lake Camp for Boys and Girls, where he enjoyed two great summers, and since then has been working on many other camps, organizations, clubs, and in schools. Um, Stranger enjoys his work immensely. He has also received the Man of the Village Award and the United Way Community Builders Award. Welcome, Stranger. Thank you very much for that introduction. So good morning or good afternoon, everybody, depending on where you are from um, in this great country of Canada. I am coming to you from Ottawa. Um, again, I am a lifelong urban Inuk born in St. John's, Newfoundland, raised in Ottawa. I've been in the city since 1978. Um, and I grew up Dutch. Uh, my mom is from the Netherlands, and uh, I grew up with the Dutch um, culture. So I like I celebrate Santa Claus. So I get two Christmases, December sixth and December twenty fifth. But the Inuit culture just wasn't taught to me by my own family, by my own dad, um, because my dad went to residential schools, um, and. When I was a teenager, I finally worked up the courage to ask my dad why he didn't teach us anything about his culture. And I'll never forget this until the day I die. Uh, but my dad looked me in the eyes and he said, my son, I wanted to raise you guys westernized so that you could succeed down south. Um, and so that's why I didn't start learning about my Inuit culture until after I was 18. Um, when I moved into my very first apartment, um, I, I went through an, uh, an organization in Ottawa called Inuit Nonprofit Housing Corporation, um, and they gave me a, a, an apartment in a building with six other apartments um, that were filled with Inuit families. And so I just started asking questions um, and I just started to soak everything in that I could. Um, and then I was introduced to traditional Inuit games. Um, so these games, they're quite physical. Um, and pre-COVID, um, I actually, I'm, I'm a presenter. So I go into schools um, in the Ottawa area and I teach students um, about the Inuit culture. And we have several different presentations um, that vary from just me talking um, to doing artwork, to talking about the eight IQ principles. Um, and one of our most requested presentations pre-COVID was traditional Inuit games. I mean, it's a, it's a fun time. It gets the kids active, um, but post-COVID, um, Inuit games and COVID just don't mesh together. Um, I mean, traditional Inuit games, you have to imagine Inuit invented these games in a time before electricity, um, before like internet, before all of these fancy gadgets. Um, and, and then we were also nomads, right? Inuit didn't live in permanent locations. We traveled from spot to spot to spot, um, depending on where the best and easiest hunting was. So it's not like we were going to carry a, a full basketball um, backboard 
on our backs every time we we moved right so we couldn't have sports like like what you guys would consider sports we had to invent our own different games um and and living in such an a barren environment there's not much you can do except use your own body um and so uh, most inuit games um, require you to be standing right next to somebody or interacting with somebody, touching somebody, their games played against each other um, for strength and balance and agility. And, and so since COVID started, since the lockdown, since that one March break that got extended, um, I haven't done Inuit games since. And it's been really tough um, because that is my only or was my only outlet for sports and for my my energy um, and it kept me busy there were some weeks where i would do um, presentations in five elementary schools and, and seven presentations each day so i did inuit games like 35 times in a week and then it all just stopped um and so yeah just like um the presenter before me um i also struggled with depression and with other things uh, but then i realized that i had all this extra time um and so i don't know if you can see like right here these are remotes for some of my rc vehicles um and so that's what i do for recreation now on the weekends i go out to a forest and i go on a walk with my rc cars and what's really great is um in ottawa at Inukatagi, we have a learning hubs. So all the schools in Ontario, in Ottawa, um, they've, they've gone into lockdown. Nobody's attending school physically. And so everything is done virtually. And what's really nice about these learning hubs is that the workers who are working there are finding creative ways for our students to earn their credits. So for instance, my son, 15 years old in high school, needs to get a gym credit. Well, there, I mean, there's not much we can do to show that, right? So my son, like this last weekend, we went and played with our RC vehicles um, and took pictures. And my son now gets to apply that towards his gym credits. Um, and then like when he fixes his RC vehicles, he's allowed to apply that to like a technical credit. Um, and so these, these amazing workers are finding different ways for each individual student um, to be able to still get their, um, their marks and, and especially in gym, right? Like what, what's, what's there to do? And so they're finding all these nice creative ways um, to figure that out. And then hopefully with the vaccines being rolled out, uh, we'll be able to start doing the Inuit games in schools again, um, because I know the schools, the students are missing it. Um, and I know that I'm missing it a lot too. Um, and so, yeah, um, I mean, COVID has even affected the Arctic Winter Games. So uh, if you've never heard about the Arctic Winter Games, they happen every two years. They're like the Olympics of traditional Inuit and Dene games. Um, and during the during the Arctic Winter Games, there are sports like volleyball um, and, and other team sports, but the big attractions are, are the traditional Inuit games. Um, and the biggest attractions in the Arctic Winter Games are the one foot high kick, the two foot high kick, um, and the Alaskan high kick, which are amazing to watch and see. Um, and for the first time ever, the Arctic Winter Games had to be postponed um, due to COVID. So, Hopefully those will be making a, a, a comeback too. Because up north, like every community up north has a hockey arena, they have a community center, and they have a sports field. But here's the problem with having all of those equipment. I mean, those are required for team sports, right? And when you live in a community like Greece Fjord that has less than 250 people who live there, um, I mean, can you have um, 12, 12 year olds to form a hockey team, right? So, so 
team sports up north is a really hard thing to do. Um, and that's why, like, we still play all of these traditional um, Inuit games. And then, like, we are youth up north. They train specifically um, for the Inuit games. Um, and I, in Ottawa, I would love to see, like, a, a, an annual traditional Indigenous games um so like how people how, how the school boards have um track and field annually uh, i would love to see uh, where all the schools get together and the students participate in traditional indigenous games um and earn um awards and medals and stuff like that um and that's a dream of mine that hopefully will come to fruition um before my time on this planet is done um, and on that note, I would like to pass it on to our very next presenter. Um, and thank you very much for having me and for listening. Thank you, stranger, for all the work that you're doing to promote Inuit traditional games and uh, culture, especially for the children and youth who are living in, in Ottawa. And I do hope that your dream comes true. Um, thank you so much again for that beautiful presentation. Our next presenter is Brady Paul, and he's coming from uh, Nova Scotia, but he's from uh, St. Mary's First Nations in uh, New Brunswick. He's a proud member of the Wulastuij uh, people. Uh, he's a graduate from St. Mary's University and he has contributed to many organizations and institutions over the years, including the 2020 North American Indigenous Games. Uh, Brady is currently the Community Outreach Coordinator with the Nova Scotia Community College and through a combination of his personal experiences along with his studies, uh, it has instilled in him a dedication for Indigenous wellness, advocacy, preservation, and sport. Sports and recreation remain two of the major priorities in Brady's life. So welcome, Brady. Wiliwan, Nil de Liwas Brady Paul, Nil de Jayas Lances, Naga Willis Bequake. Good afternoon or good morning, everyone. My name is Brady Paul, and I am from St. Mary's First Nation, and I am a member of the Willis Bequake people, um, which means people of the beautiful and bountiful river. Um, I am I'm here today from Dartmouth, Nova Scotia, and uh, I'm here to speak on physical activity and sport in Indigenous communities during COVID-19. Just give me one moment. And just so to begin, I'd love to give a brief overview and introduction of myself more. Um, I was fortunate enough to grow up in a First Nation community. I lived 21 years in community and seven outside. Um, and I only left the community for my employment now and uh, my past education. Um, throughout that time, um, I was kind of at an adolescence. I had um, a hard time trying to figure out where I fit in, especially when I left education, especially schooling in community and went outside community. Um, and I kind of only kept my clo friends close, the ones I knew that were from community. Um, but then once I got exposed to sports, uh, mainly hockey and football, um, I began to start meeting, you know, other people and also ultimately led me on to this journey that I'm currently still on and, you know, physical wellness and, and athletics and recreation. Um, I was fortunate enough to continue my education and athletics at Acadia University and St. Mary's University. Um, I graduated uh, from St. Mary's University with a Bachelor of Arts with a major in history. And I was fortunate enough that the institution allowed me to cater my research and studies to indigenous themes. And, and I'm fortunate enough that in the fall, I'll be returning to St. Mary's University to do my master's. Um, 
So just a brief overview of what we'll be covering today. Um, misinformation and misconceptions on physical wellness during COVID-19, um, maintaining physical activity and athletic ability during that COVID-19, areas to improve on at the community level um, that's pertaining to Indigenous communities. And this is based on my, my experiences, what I've seen in other communities, um, especially around physical education, recreation, athletics, and a lot of nutrition, and uh, principles for, uh, for physical activity and athletic programming. Um, and that stems from um, my experience working with a many a different coaches, top high level coaches, some professional athletes and some of the best amateur athletes you can um, be with, work with, uh, mainly in the football side. But um, we'll touch on that later in the presentation um, uh, about programming for athletes. And so one, some of the biggest misconceptions I see or I get asked um, is first it starts around nutrition. Um, everyone tends to see they want or wants to see results quickly and right away. Um, and that's just not the case. Um, so when, when you decide to go on this journey or when you decide, okay, I need to improve this area of my life, um, think long-term. Because um, from my experience, you know, when you climb a hill faster, when you get to the top, the fall is twice as fast. Um, and so first and foremost, fad diets and trendy diets tend to lead to a yo-yo effect. And what that yo-yo effect is, is generally in people who aren't athletes or come from an athletic background, um, they don't have the, the base or the motivation to couple that with physical activity through exercise and mainly strength, strength exercise. And what that does is you have an individual who goes on a trendy diet or a fad diet and they lose a lot of body fat very quickly. Um, but what you don't know from internally is that you're also burning a lot of muscle. And so what happens when you deplete it and you lose that fat body fat and then you also burn off that muscle and you, a diet only has a start and an end period. And so after you finish your diet, you tend to you know go off the rails and go back to your normal eating habits. But what happens then you're you're, you're consuming a lot more ca refined carbohydrates, I find, and non, um, not the best quality of food. And what that does is it skyrockets your body weight. But what is forgotten is when you lose that weight, you lost that muscle, that, that muscle is what supports, you know, your posture. It allows you to function and move and move things. And that what happens there is you gain that weight but you lost that muscle. So then you aren't able to do the things you could before your energy levels are low, you're weaker, you don't have the capacity to do anything physically or mentally. And I feel like this is a trap that a lot of people I see fall into. And so that's why I made it a point to share that. And it's important over this time, since we are at home and we can control these variables, this is the time to lay the foundation for healthy habits and thinking of changing your lifestyle and not the diet. Because when you do say diet and you look at the image, you know, people tend to over-exaggerate that diet is suffering, which is not. And so, and also one more point I would like to make, social media is not a reliable source for any physical activity, uh, strength training programming or nutritional advice. Um, it's just too much misinformation and it's unregulated and I just don't believe in it. And it also causes a lot of mental stress as well. Um, when I tell people you don't have to suffer to see results, I kind of get looked at or wrong, like weirdly. Um, when you see in the next slide, these concepts kind of that I'm listening here kind of make sense. So um, eat foods you enjoy. Don't don't impose things on yourself or make yourself suffer for any foolish reason. You're allowed to eat the foods you enjoy, but I opt, I would opt to have it at its purest form or its natural form. Um, the creator created these foods in a specific way because they are full of vitamins, they are full of nutrients, they're full of fiber and all these great things. It's made perfect as it is already. So there's no way to improve something that's perfect. It's made to be that way. It's made for us to be absorbing it. And when you add in things like highly processed foods, especially sugar and refined carbohydrates and trans fats and man-made fats, 
um, that just spells a disaster. And if you can look at the evidence as well, when we move from a colonial uh, traditional diet, you know, of you know vegetables, berries, fruits, and lean meat and fish, and then we went into the colonial diet, which is you know wheat and sugar based. Um, diabetes and obesity rose within our population. Another thing people kind of fall into is a uh, supplementation. Um, supplements are great, but they have a healthy place within our diets and our lifestyle, but it's not essential. Um, kind of think about taking a multivitamin and it's full of all these great things, but you don't know what you're deficient in or you don't know what you're getting from fruit or missing from your diet. So a little assembly is required, but I don't believe in nuking the problem and bombarding yourself with a ton of vitamins and minerals that you don't need just to cover your bases. I believe in getting everything I need from food, especially um, vegetables and fruits, and everything else tends to fall into place. Um, another thing I would, I like to do personally, but you, I believe helps keep you on this lifestyle change is that rotating cooking methods and or types of proteins. Um, you know, no one can't eat chicken every day or no one can eat white fish every day, or you can't eat scrambled eggs every day because it's good to eat a fried egg or a boiled egg because uh, if you eat the same thing over time, um, people tend to develop allergies to food or cause gastrointestinal issues and you're not absorbing all the great things that come from food. And I love quotes. I love, I know, silly things just to make that connection too. So, um, you know, you know, you're not going to die doing a diet and I'll um, start doing and believing in stuff that works and do it today and forever. Um, you know, this is a marathon, not a sprint. And if you, you know, sprint, you know, you, it, it will just motivate you less next time around when you need to do that. And it'll be harder each and every time you do that. So uh, simple rule for my life. I never let myself um, get comfortable or get complacent. Now that we touched on when not to do, don't follow a fad diet, but if you are looking to implement a certain diet strategy, like the keto diet, or, you know, there's the, there's a ton of different diets, but the one biggest one I've always seen was keto. And people tended to just eat enormous amounts of fats and little protein. And you know, that's a misconception. Um, and if you look at this graph here, this is generally what goes on inside our bodies, especially at rest and when we eat food. So our basic basal metabolic rate is the number of calories your body needs to accomplish um, you know, life-sustaining function. Um, and as you can see within this graph um, of your daily caloric intake, yeah, that's about 70% of your calories. So if you, the food that you ate, um, you know, you could just sit and do nothing. You're already going to burn 70% of your calories. When you move on, when you eat food, the thermal effect of food, your body has to use energy to digest that food, absorb it, and to shuttle nutrients around in your body. And that's roughly around another 10%. Um, now we get into some interesting concepts here. NEAT or non-exercise activity thermogenesis is the energy expended for everything we do that's not sleeping, eating, or any sport or weight training. Um, and that includes just walking to the store, walking up and down, folding laundry, you know, carrying your grocery bags in the house or walking around the grocery store. Um, and that's actually a nice big chunk of that, of those calories as well. Um, it's around 15%. And then you have exercise activity thermogenesis, and this is planned physical activity. It's either, you know, you're heading to the gym, you have a specific distance in a run, or you're playing a sport. And so how do you use this information? Um, your, everyone's BMI, B, BMR is different. So it, it is largely is uh, influenced by your age, your weight, and your gender, and your activity level. Um, you can easily find a calculator for this online just to see how much you should be eating in a day because a lot of people I work with, especially young athletes that ask me for advice, I go, how much are you eating on in a day? And it's next to nothing what is what's needed or required. And, you know, under eating is just as bad as overeating because then you start having, you know, these mental issues 
you have no energy, you have depression falls in, you know, and you're angry and you're upset and you're just not pleasant to be around. So why put yourself through something? Why not bring this up optimally? So then you're able to have better conversations. You're better to retain more information. You're, you're better at your job. You're better with your kids. Your overall quality of life will improve. And so those are a few, um, especially around nutrition and especially around since we're all at home, we all have the time to build these healthy habits over time. Um, the worst thing you can do is jump on a new diet and eat a list of foods prescribed to you that don't ag agree with you. I don't believe anyone should eat something they don't want to but I believe we should be more closely following our traditional diet as we used to. So, you know, eating moose, bison, lots of salmon, lots of vegetables, um, potatoes, sweet potato, things that occur naturally in the world. And then you stop getting all these things and bad hormones that in, in time um, causes a, a lot of issues within the body. So moving in with that in nutritional information, now we can couple that with some few simple um, um, activities we can do at home and with our families. And so how to maintain physical activity and also athletic ability during COVID um, is actually quite simple. I, I love to make things simpler. The ultimate sophistication is simplification. So for adults and youth, I would opt to have designated times for physical activity. So in my role right now, I work completely remotely, but every day from 12 to, from 12 to 1.30, I have blocked out. That's my time to weight train. Um, I have everything. I have all my programs planned out for the year along with my nutritional plan, but we'll touch back on that in the next slide. Um, but these are some things I kind of suggest to people when they ask what to do. Um, I'm not confident are comfortable sharing any workout program until I've done an assessment with someone. So what are their mobility? What are their limitations? What's their current strength level? What is their previous experience with weight training? Um, because I do come from a weight training background. Um, it's what allowed me to reach a high level in my sport. And I just love it. I got bit by the iron bug, as I say, and I haven't stopped training. And I've been actually following the same um, training regimen for the past 12 years. And I've never been really injured and I've been consistently progressing and getting better. And it's all, I do it for me and no one else. Um, so for adults and for youth, and as when I mean youth, I mean someone in their teens coming out of uh, adolescence or as a child. And so first and foremost, the adult in the house has to set the standard. Um, I believe if you lead by example, people in house will follow. And it's hard to say to children, you must eat healthy, you have to be physically active if you're not going to do it yourself. I believe it's very contradictory and it sets a bad example. So lead by example, set the standard and, and continue with it. Um, here's a couple of key things I'd like to implement, especially during COVID when we're very limited. Um, 10 minutes walks after meals. Um, first and foremost, this is a great way to increase your NEAT because as you see in the previous slide, as I'll go back, um, about only a small portion of your actual caloric expenditure is through planned exercise. And so what that means is we can bring up that NEAT, we can consume an appropriate amount of food a day, a food we like, but you know we're not going to have weight gain which is the main thing. We're, we're simply simplifying things and we're also laying out the plan. We're eating regularly and then we're actually coupling in 10 minutes of walking after each meal. Um, um, I'm just saying this as for me, um, I eat six times a day. I know it seems like a lot, but it's actually not because I'm, I'm just always hungry. And But if you do 10 minutes of walking after each meal, that's 60 minutes of walking a day. Um, and that's a great way to increase your need if you're if that is um, what you're trying to do and which all of us should be trying to do during this time. But there's also some associated benefits with that. So after while you do that walk after your meal, um, it improves digestion of your food. And so what that does is 
a lot of people can't really absorb all the nutrients in our, in our food and we have a lot of gastric issues. So gut health is very important to a healthy lifestyle and it's a largely overlooked component. And so once we improve that, you know, we're, we're absorbing all our food, we're, we're absorbing all those vitamins and minerals and all those good nutrients. Now we're not as hungry anymore, but also the walking allows for a better partitioning effect. So you're driving these nutrients into the bloodstream that go to the muscle that circulate through the body. It goes to where it needs to be so we can be optimal for the day. Um, next would be master body weight exercises. Um, you know, Rome wasn't built in a day. So take this time, you know, perfect the squat, air squat, perfect the push up, perfect the pull up if you can. But if you can't, do what you can, then look for logical progressions through. Um, don't get caught up sets, reps, or lacks of exercises. Um, you know, that I feel like that's just, uh, it gives you an out, I find. And if you ask, if you just master push ups and squats, when you can go back to weights, you can see that you you maintain that movement pattern. So there's less, there's more carryover in your years. There's less reacclimation to lifting and which will boost your confidence. And for child toddlers and children, just play with your children. Kids, if you ever watch a toddler, they run, they jump and they climb things. And it's, you know, that's physical activity. That is their exercise. That's them developing motor patterns and developing strength. Um, do this as much as you can, because you're not only bonding with your child during this time, but you're creating positive physical activity experiences. And, and sorry, I missed this in my last slide, but you want to create a positive relationship with food. You want to create a positive relationship with physical activity. You know, and that may mean if you're doing your body weight squats and you're doing an extraordinary amount of like 20, 25 plus of reps, grab your child, you know, grab that. You know, if you have a little toddler, grab them. They're laughing. You're doing squats. And you know what? You're bonding. You're creating that moment and it's laying the foundation that in your child that, okay, physical activity is important. It's important to my parent. You know what? It's going to be important to me. And they see you eating healthy foods. They're going to want those foods. And so it's instilling those healthy habits early. And so we don't have these issues later on in life. Um, as for athletes, um, you should be a, you should be maintaining a certain level of conditioning. So, um, you know, fields or I just I just walk. I walk everywhere, but you know, you can run hills, you can do sprints, but just maintain that and maintain some strength work. So work on if you can't do a pull up, maybe your goal should be able to do one pull up. Once you do one, you can do two. Um, same with push ups. Um, you know. And also practice sports specific drills. You know, if you're, I would, you know, if you have a basketball, get really good at, do your dribbling drills. If you have a hockey stick in a net, work on your handling, work on your shot. You know, don't get complacent because, um, you know, it's the best people who stay on top of those things, who progress farther in the sport. And I believe, you know, I don't want to discourage everyone from sport. I never want anyone to get discouraged because I think sports are one of the best things. Um, in this world and it brings so many different people together and it, it allows you to prepare for your season when it comes back up or when things open you're ready to go and you're ready to make an impact on your team and then it kind of lays the foundation that okay i can get better on my own uh what well, let's let's start to build off these things and so these are just some tips and tricks to maintain physical activity and be physically active during covid and what to do as an athlete um, I could talk about this all day, but for time's sake, I have to continue and I hope you uh, put some great questions that I hope I can answer moving forward. Um, this is one that I was completely, I was looking forward to the most is areas to improve on indigenous communities. Um, uh, in my time preparing for this, I reflected a lot on the services in my community. And I noticed that um, generally, um, people are put into roles that they're not qualified for or they're not passionate about. And so first and foremost, if you're going to build the right staff, the people have to be passionate, educated, and have the personal and professional experience. Um, your programs will be a reflection of that. Um, and multi-layered support. So family and home support and participation. You know, 
It's not my job. It's not anyone's job in this world to raise other people's children. That's the parent's role. So get your support your child, you know, encourage them to do sports or, or to be out, be active. Um, when they go to practice, watch. When they go to games, be there. Um, especially community members um, and, and, and support stuff because um, I don't, you know, if you say this is important, especially education, but you don't practice those things on yourself, you know, I find it hypocritical. And, you know, this is why that I do that I do. And I always want to provide accurate information for athletes and help anyone who asks because, you know, I don't need to be an elected official to invoke change in my community. And so no one else does. If we raise good kids, our communities will get better. Um, don't program what you don't know. I've seen this so much in my life where specific exercises or methods and that people don't know or they wouldn't do themselves or they give nutritional advice on a diet they have no experience with or they would never do themselves. Um, those are kind of the people who want to manipulate or just make money and that's not what it's all about. Um, seek assistance, you know, get educated or reach out professionals in the field. You're doing a disservice when you don't if you're not constantly gaining knowledge. So principles for, principles for successful physical activity programming. Set a goal, devise a plan, and what are your short, medium, and long-term goals in, in years? You have to map out your programming and you have to do things with purpose, purpose and have associated benefits. I've seen a lot of my life when people, they say, do this, do this, especially with past strength coaches. I'm like, what, why would I do this just to do it? They're like, yeah. And I'm like, what's the purpose? And they can't have an answer. So if they don't have a purpose for it, I don't have a purpose for it. Be realistic. Attendance and participation are going to be low, but that's just general because what you need to be is constant and always accessible to community. Track participation and progress. Have indicators and standards. Um, having standards in training or in your programming is crucial um, because um, if I can provide an example, whenever I do help someone with their training, before I put a barbell in their hands or on their back, you have to be able to do a goblet squat for 50 unbroken reps and to be able to do 50 push-ups. And what that does, it allows me to strengthen up your arm, your lower body, and also you're practicing the movement a lot. Um, I believe in technical proficiency, especially when lifting weights, because it can get dangerous. And the goal for, um, especially athletic training, um, it kind of gets misinterpreted, as you can see, um, the difference between GPP, which is general physical preparedness, which is developing strength, coordination, mobility, and conditioning, and then specialized physical preparedness, which is the skill associated with a sport. And so I don't believe there's no sport-specific training. No exercise is going to make you a better hockey player or a better tennis player, but what training does, it uh, brings down the chances and risks of injury. And when now when you're in practice, you're spending less time conditioning and you're actually working more on skill development and philosophy and plays and strategy. Lastly, I wanted to include this slide. I know I'm going a little bit over because I kind of didn't know how long it would be, but I'm passionate about this. Um, and what is the reason for me to do this? And everyone should do this before they embark on this journey because it makes it real to you. And I just wanna walk through mine um, because they all have purpose. Um, I do not own my body. It is a gift from the creator and I want to return it in good condition. Um, I believe that we are blessed with the gift of life to see these beautiful things, to eat these good foods, to hear our beautiful languages. And I want to return my body. I want to experience these gifts for as long as I can. So I'll take care of my body. Um, I choose my own sacrifices and suffering. Um, I'm very stubborn and hard-headed. So I don't like authority, especially, you know, from the government. Uh, and so I, I choose my own sacrifices and I choose my suffering. And then it's kind of liberating because, you know, you find out what doesn't matter. Um, I want to be self-reliant. Um, that's plain and simple. Um, I know I'm someone's child, but there's going to be a point in my life where I have to be independent and I have to lead by example. Um, a hard body keeps the mind sharp. A sharp mind keeps the body hard. It goes hand in hand. Um, it's the body that enables us to think clearly. So the body feels the mind. And once the mind's thinking clearly, 
we can identify our purpose in life and what we want and that fuels our spirit and the spirit fuels the body so it, it feeds into itself constantly it's nutrition it's being physically active and then it's finding purpose and you can apply those principles of mapping and planning to on anything in your life if it's academic or professional um, you have to plan uh, i believe Mentally and physically strong people are essential to society. I'll just leave it at that. Any investment into my mind and body always yields benefit, returns and benefits. Um, I see it all the time. People invest more in material things than they do themselves. And I think that's heading the wrong way in life. Um, I am privileged to be able to do the things I love every day. Um, I live in a country where um, I have access to great healthcare and all these resources, um, and I'm not gonna waste them. And lastly, to honor all the people who fought before me. And it's a part of our heritage to fight and to be strong. Um, a lot of indigenous people fought for this country, even when a time when the government and the rest of Canada turned their back on them or tried to eradicate them. And they fought because they knew if they didn't preserve what was here at the time, we would keep losing more, more rights and more of our land and more of ourselves over time. And well, Ewan, thank you. And uh, I love to include a lot of traditional language into my presentation as much as I can. So, Bowidha Zu, Wow Zu Wagen. I know it's a very long word, but it's a sentence and it's allow your thinking to change so that action will follow in a good way toward truth. Well, Ewan. Thank you so much, Brady, for, for sharing your, your true passion for sport and activity and your thoughts on how, um, practical thoughts on how we can stay uh, healthy and well during COVID-19, uh, including uh, the use of traditional foods and nutrition. I really wanna thank you for that. Um, our last speaker is uh, Dr. Heather Foulds, who is an assistant professor in the College of Kinesiology at the University of Saskatchewan. Dr. Foulds also holds, a research, uh, holds research grants from the Saskatchewan Health Research Foundation and CIHR investigating health benefits of Métis dancing, including the Red River Jig. Her research program explores cardiovascular health determinants with specific focuses on Indigenous populations and women's cardiovascular health. Dr. Foulds currently serves as an interim scientific director with the Mamoe Kikayak Healing Together Métis Health and Wellness Research Network within the First Nations and Métis Health Research Network. Welcome, Dr. Fould. Good morning or good afternoon. Um, thank you for the invitation to speak today. Um, <clears throat> I'm joining you here today from Saskatoon, Saskatchewan, the homeland of the Métis and Treaty 6 territory. And thank you again for having me. Um, the next slide. So I'm uh, Métis and my family originally came from the Red River settlement and then um, we moved to Saskatchewan, the next, uh, next slide, to um, primarily Métis communities of Versailles and Langmead, which are along the highway between Saskatoon and Edmonton. Um, the next slide. And then after World War II, my family moved out to um, British Columbia and Coquitlam, which is a suburb of Vancouver. So we're no longer in a Métis community. And then I was born in um, Prince George, British Columbia, which is the next slide. Um, so I was away from my uh, grandparents and cousins and aunts and uncles and, and my Métis family. Um, and the next slide, I started my uh, schooling in Prince George at the University of Northern British Columbia. And um, then I moved to Vancouver on the next slide to UBC um, to finish my graduate school. And then um, the next slide, I have been in Saskatoon at the University of Saskatchewan for the last seven years. And um, I live here with my family. Um, the next slide. So my two of my children are here. My youngest is born during the pandemic, so we haven't been able to do the same kind of activities with him that we could do with the other two. Um, but my story has, my journey has very much been a retracing of the steps of my family and coming back to our homeland and, and connecting back with our community and 
uh, culture and, and trying to relearn our language and, uh, and traditions um, and trying to share that with my family. Um, the next slide. So I, I, I'm in kinesiology and, and just a few kind of definitions to keep us on the same page here. Physical activity, talking about movement that requires energy. So you're doing something. It could be purposeful exercise. You're trying to exercise your body, but it could also be things that you do in your daily life, like housekeeping or gardening or um, walking somewhere if you're going, going to travel or, or move. It could be something you do at work that requires you to move. Um, and then sedentary behavior is um, a different kind of behavior of activity. It's where you're you're seated or reclined and not doing a lot of uh, energy expenditure. So that could be sitting here watching the screen, watching me talk, um, riding the bus, um, or whatever that might be. So not necessarily the opposite of physical activity, but a different category. Um, and we know that physical activity is is really beneficial for us. And if we look at the next slide, this is. Um, some results from some of my graduate work. We, we partnered with a number of indigenous communities around the province in British Columbia, and they did uh, walking or running programs within their communities. And the participants had health improvements, which um, is common for physical activity. You can improve your well being, so blood pressure, cholesterol, uh, waist circumference, and um, be more physically active. So the next slide. Um, we know, so we know that physical activity is beneficial for us and it helps your, your, not just your body, but your mind and so forth. And if I think about things from a Métis perspective and my, um, my culture, and I think similar among a lot of Indigenous cultures, is that it's not just physical activity. We're not just doing it to improve our physical health or to stay uh, fit or, or strong or whatever your goals are. Um, there's a lot more to it. And a lot of physical activity, especially our traditional activities, would have... Um, that kinship and social component, so gathering with your family or your community, um, maintaining those social connections and the relationships, uh, a lot of intergenerational activities, bringing the children along, having the elders and, and the knowledge keepers, and then more than just doing physical activity and, and being well, there's the, the cultural aspect and the learning and the teachings and the storytellings that go along with it. So I've been really enjoying it and connecting with dancing as my main um, physical activity in, in Saskatchewan since I've moved here. And I really enjoy the, all of those aspects of getting together with, with our community and with, with the family and friends and, and neighbors and um, engaging in the dance and practicing the dance, but also hearing the stories. So the stories the people around me and, and the elders are telling, but also the stories that are embedded in the dances or embedded in the activities. So um, this pandemic, of course, has kind of interrupted a lot of those opportunities. And uh, the next slide. Um, so some of the research that I've been doing has been looking at what kind of supports or um, factors support us to be physically active as Indigenous people and that are, that are unique to Indigenous people. So this is a, a, an article that we published recently, finding that being connected to your culture is beneficial for being physically active, that people who are more connected to their culture are more physically active. And this is similar to some of my graduate work that people are more connected to their culture or have lower rates of hypertension. So it's a, it's a really positive aspect of our health and our well-being. Um, and the next slide. So we're, we're working on some of the next aspects of other factors that, uh, that are positive and supportive for us as Indigenous peoples to be physically active. So that connection to culture, um, the next slide, we've been looking at um, the support systems that we have. So certainly in the time of COVID, if we think about it from that perspective, do you have family or friends or members of your community who could help you if you were isolating? Are there people who could help you get your groceries? Are there people who could help you to, um, to stay safe or to stay healthy? And so having the, those kind of support systems is, are also really beneficial for our health from a physical activity perspective. So having friends or family who support you um, enables you to be more physically active. And um, what we're finding is that the community support came out as the strongest one of those different levels of support. So having your community around you and being, um, being part of a community that supports you is, is really helpful for being physically active. Um, and then the next slide, um, the other big thing that's influencing our, our ability to be active and, uh, and how sedentary we are as well is if you have to relocate from your home community. 
So having to leave your home community makes it more challenging to be physically active. Um, and it also, we're finding that um, it means that you're more sedentary often. And, I, and I, I don't know whether that's because you're trying to travel or connect with people back home or if it's just because you don't have the supports readily at hand. Um, kind of the next steps of, of better understanding how we can engage ourselves to be physically active. Yeah, so these are some pictures of, of my, myself and my daughter dancing. And prior to the pandemic, this, as I said, was my main uh, physical activity source as we would gather as a community at one of the schools and we would dance and learn and and engage in the activity and and as well as the culture and the stories and all of those components that are happening and so of course COVID comes along and, and we can't gather like this so it's been quite a journey for myself and my family and how changing how we engage and how we how we are, are active and the types of activities we're doing and so I um, was going to share with you some of the stories uh, from from our perspective, and I would say that there are two strategies that we've used, and I think some of these you've probably heard about from some of the other presenters. So the first challenge, if I think back to those different supports on the sash, was um, the family support is the one that we can continue to engage during the pandemic. That we're stuck at home, but we still are together with our family. Um, so the next slide, uh, I've got. Um, so this is a, a bit of a side a side talk, but some op options and opportunities. One of my colleagues at the University of Saskatchewan has been doing research with masks and finding that it's completely safe to exercise with a mask. You can you can do high intensity exercise. It's not gonna impact how much oxygen, oxygen you're getting. So um, within restrictions, as we've been able to, um, me and my family, we wear our masks and we go to, um, go to the park or go for a walk and, and meet up with friends or family or whatever supports um, we're able to meet up with within the conditions we can wear our masks we can be outside we can be distanced but still be together and still have that connection and, and engagement um, and then otherwise we are working together as a family so the next slide and the next few slides will be um, pictures so we found out very quickly the kids come home from last March when we had to stay uh, stay within your household playgrounds are shut down um, the kids could not stay inside all day they had to go outside twice a day or they would go completely stir crazy um, I was still working um, very pregnant my son was born um, last May so during the pandemic uh, and so life had to be different we couldn't just work all day and, and my life prior to the pandemic I would sit in front of the computer and work for long hours of the day and, and be very sedentary at those times and then get up and be active later on so this is one of the ways the pandemic has really changed um, our lives is that uh, I might work for a little bit and then I have to get up and go take the kids outside. We have to go for a walk or we have to go play in the snow or um, go skating on the lake, which is um, the picture on the left here. Whatever kind of options we came up with, but we had to do something outside. Um, so the next slide. Of course, we have a variety of different winter conditions in Saskatchewan. We've really taken up biking. So early on uh, at the bottom there, finding puddles with our tricycles and, and trying to keep the kids um, busy and engaged and doing what they would enjoy because they like doing different things, even if it's riding a bike in the snow, um, making that happen. And then now that they're a bit older, we've been doing bigger, longer bike rides as a family and try to just we'll go to the next neighborhood over and find their playground or go go somewhere further away and, and go for a, um, just a ride or a, a trip or a picnic or something but trying to manage the being active and breaks up our day uh, next slide and again that doesn't matter the weather we have to get outside the kids can't stay in so in the rain and the snow we go for a walk we do something um, and so focusing on that family, they're supporting me to be active because they get me out of the house. I'm supporting them to be active because they need to get out of the house. Um, they need to move and uh, whatever that looks like. So the next slide, the uh, and then on the water as we can. We uh, are fortunate to have a little lake nearby that we can go paddling on and the kids love to get out on the water and we did manage to get out fishing a few weeks ago. So starting to get to that weather. Um, the next slide. So the other side of it, trying to think about that cultural of physical activity and being engaged as best we can remotely. Um, we've been fortunate that 
the different Métis communities have had a number of different remote events and remote activities. So the, the two pictures, the center and the picture on the right, um, there was a remote uh, jigging competition. So I got my kids dancing and videotaped them and then we watched it on the TV when they had the video, their jigging competition. And it's amazing how much kids pick up even though they're not practicing. We, we bring them to the dance prior to the pandemic and they don't sit and dance with us all day they're mostly playing while we're dancing but then I get them up dancing when it's their turn and they uh they can do a lot it's really amazing how much they pick up from watching and then my daughter's in school now and she was teaching her class at school about jigging and, and the sash and she's showing them the Red River jig so trying to share that a little bit with her community at school um and then for the next slide is I guess the most exciting part for me you can kind of see my computer in the in the background, and uh, I've been very fortunate. Our our dance community has had a couple of sessions of a few months of um, online Zoom jigging. So we get on on the session just like this, and and our instructor puts the music on his screen, and and he teaches us some new steps. So we're working on learning new fancy steps, and we keep dancing and get the exercise in our living rooms, but also get to continue to connect with our community, and connect with the, the people that we have. It's not the same as getting together in person. We don't have the same kind of social time and we can only really do the jigging. We can't do all the other dances, but um, it's definitely been one of the highlights of the pandemic for me was being able to maintain that community connection and uh, being able to continue dancing even though we're remote and we're all in our own living rooms. And of course, there are challenges with internet connections, and sometimes it works better than others, but uh, anything we get is better than nothing. Um, so the next slide, I just want to say thank you to all of the communities that are supporting me and my community advisors, investigators, students, um, everybody that is uh, supporting me to be doing this research and to be on this presentation. And thank you all for having me. And then I think the last slide is questions, which I think we're heading to next. So Kishji Marcy for having me today again. Thank you. Thank you so much, Heather, for broadening what physical activity is and encompasses, as well as uh, bringing in the cultural elements and supports that are needed for continued wellness for Indigenous peoples during this time and going beyond this time. So we do have um, just about 15 minutes for questions. So I'm going to uh, go through some of the questions that have come in. And I'm going to actually address um, one to each of you, um, starting with Trisha. So could you um, provide um, any avenues for more information that can be accessed for people who are um, living with chronic uh, it, diseases, mobility issues, or disabilities? Right, that's a great question. Um, I think for me, the resources that I turn to now in particular are social media um, online communities. And so whether it be Facebook or Twitter, but mostly Twitter these days, um, or Instagram, I ensure that I follow leaders in, uh, in, who are disabled, uh, who practice wellness from a disability perspective. And from their perspectives, I'm able to better learn and situate my own practices of wellness through living with chronic illness. Um, and also, I wanted to talk in, um, Roberta, I'm not sure if you're going to throw this question to somebody else, but I would love to return to the question that Lisa asked in the, uh, in the comments about disability and sport when we have a time. But for to answer the question, it's mostly learning um, through social media communities, of course, uh, living through COVID and also reaching into my networks as well. And if you do want to touch upon Lisa's question, I'd be happy for you to do so. Oh, okay, great. Yeah, uh, just to say, Lisa, that's a very important question that you brought up. And for those of you who might not have read it, she was wondering if there's a place for disability or disabled Indigenous sport. And I'm involved in a study uh, where I'm working closely with Ms. Lori Buffalo, who is a member of Chief and Council um, out of the Musquachese communities um, in Treaty 6 territory, where we're looking at this. 
specifically. Um, when I was living in Alberta for two years, I was there at the University of Alberta. Um, I was able to participate in meaningful conversations about this topic. And we found in our early study of the environmental scan of just Alberta, um, out of all of the physical activity and recreation and sport programming available for people who live with disabilities in Alberta, only five of them were targeted towards specifically Indigenous people who live with disabilities. So that's an analysis that revealed only four to eight percent of disability programming in Alberta is available for Indigenous peoples. We are now expanding this to a national based environmental scan and the early results of that are the same. It is very limited for folks who live with disabilities um, who are Indigenous. And so our, our current project is to better understand um, health, well-being, and physical activity and sport from a, a disability perspective. And so please watch out for my Twitter. Uh, we'll be showing some, uh, we're just in the middle of story collection or data collection. Uh, we'll be starting in June. So we're going to uh, dive in deeply up around this topic and hopefully shine a light on, on the voices who often we don't hear from. And those are people who live with disabilities in First Nations communities. Thank you. And Stranger, if I could um, direct the next question to you from Marnie. Um, she uh, wanted to know if, if, if thoughts could be shared on mental health and its effects on physical activity and motivation. Um, she said, I have noticed it's hard to motivate people to be physically well when challenged, when challenged with mental, spiritual, and emotional health. That can be overwhelming. I would love to answer this question. Um, so me personally, I am affected by SAD, um, seasonal affective disorder. And so for myself, when I'm in, when I'm in that funk and to help get me out of it, um, it's all about starting with baby steps, starting slowly, maybe go for a walk around the block. And then that that walk will lead into a bigger block. And then maybe I can months later go out for a longer walk, right? So it's all about little tiny baby steps. Don't try and push them too much too soon um, because mental health and physical activity are, are directly related. They're hand in hand. Um, you need one to have the other, right? And, and so when the mental aspect isn't there, then you have to work on the physical slowly while building up the mental aspect as well um and and so it is definitely baby baby steps at the beginning um and as brady mentioned in his um presentation is to have mid uh, or short mid and long-term goals and to understand that those long-term goals are maybe like five years down the road right and and so after a week of changing your 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 uh, what you're intaking into your body and, and a week after changing the physical output you're putting in you're, you're not going to see the changes that you want to see um, but knowing that five years down the road they'll come um, and to understand that short mid and long term and when somebody's dealing with with mental health issues that that create barriers for the physical activity then those short-term goals become the most important. And, and you can kind of like talk a little bit about the midterm goals and, and, and then like, don't even worry about the long-term goals until their mental health capacity um, catches up to where their physical being is. And, and then they can start looking at those long-term goals after they've, they've improved a little bit, right? So again, baby steps and, and, and work on both. You can't just work on the physical, and expect the mental to come along with it, right? You have to work on both aspects. Okay, the next uh, question is for Brady. So there was uh, comments about uh, really enjoying the discussions around uh, that you that you brought up about traditional diets and foods. Um, do you have any awesome indigenous resources on diabetes that you can share? No, not necessarily because when I look at it, I look at it from the whole spectrum, but I would, uh, if I can point you in the right direction, it would be looking at um, what the benefits are of a, a long term, you know, high protein, high fat and lower carb diet for that individual because 
um, when you do eat a lot of refined carbohydrates, you get that spike in blood sugar. And when you're, you can't produce insulin, that's where you cause those issues. So if you mitigate those spikes in blood sugar, eating a lot of fiber helps eating a lot of, you know, lean proteins and especially fatty meats helps keep blood sugar down. Um, you know, like our traditional meat, salmon, um, salmon is high on the omega-3, um, EPA, DHA fatty acids. And so with those, those actually help control uh, blood sugar levels as well. So having an adequate amount of uh, fish oil is important and also spills in over to joint health and brain function. And so that's one of the most underlooked things I see with people is this not having a healthy balance of fat within the diet. So get a uh, higher quality beef and meat and chicken, eat whatever, eat lots of fish, eat, have a variety of different meats, um, eat your vegetables. I, I don't, I don't understand. Like we need to eat vegetables to function. Um, it's like, as I said, the creator made these foods for us to ingest as they are, you know, we can eat them raw and we're not going to get sick. That's why they come in the wild. That's why they're meant to be there. Um, not breakfast cereal. Um, breakfast cereal has only been around for a hundred years and it's just sugar and yeah, it's vitamin fortified, but it's just sugar and carbohydrates. Like that's all it is. And that's why we got to that point. Um, I, I, I'm, I just reflect a lot on myself. So I'm not, I don't have a sweet tooth. I have like a fat, I crave fatty pieces of meat. Um, and I think that's just based on what we are based, our diet is from. Um, Cause I just don't respond well to sugar. And it just, you know, I, I dip right after I have anything sugar. So I just decided not to eat it anymore. Thank you, Brady. There is the um, uh, National Native Diabetes Association as well. That um, could be um, a resource for um, Danica. So the last uh, question, and I know we've received uh, 18, uh, but I'm going to have to ask the last question for Heather. And it came from Charlotte. So I feel the common thread you've all shared today was being kind to self and not shaming self. Start where you're at. Thank you as we have been in isolation, not by choice. I have found it so important for the balance of mind phys and physical as we find new ways to maintain our well-being. Uh, so she wanted to know if you could share one motivator, what would that be? And maybe you're looking at the motivator in front of you. <laughs> yeah, I would say that for me, the motivator to be active is definitely the kids. I didn't have a choice. I had to take them over. I had to be active with them. Um, yeah, and, and if I think about other times in my life for being active, some of the things that have, like, it's always comes from other people. Somebody invited me to dancing, and that's how I found it. Um, and I did triathlons for a few years, even though I was the last one finishing always. But I heard a story from another Métis woman who talked about she could, she just decided to do them. And, and I heard her story, and that motivated me to, to get going too. So I think that social aspect is it's big for me. Yeah. Thank you so much. And uh, this actually brings us to a close of this really important webinar that I really want to thank each and every one of you for sharing such wonderful journeys of wellness, of balance, of recentering, of, of being kind to ourselves as we all move through this pandemic. And we will see the end to this and a new beginning. So maybe we need to start doing some pandemic planning for sports and activities and recreation as we move forward. Um, and I also want to thank everybody who participated on the webinar today. And I hope you all have wonderful, active, beautiful days wherever you are. Thank you so much.